All right, well, let's get this meeting started here so we let some more people filter in. Um, hey, everybody, thanks for coming out. Welcome to 2021. Glad to see you all here. Oh my gosh, Andy Edwards is on this call. Oh my gosh. Andy, hey, Andy. long time friend. Hi, Juan. Hi, Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah. you, man. All the yeah, way I saw the invite and I'm like, hey, I'm in Colorado. I'm going to join some people that are dressing warmer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be a part of this nice to meet everybody yeah to see you Andy. Here. hey Juan we have to have another beer when I come to New York eventually you have to come to New York eventually yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well thank you everybody for coming I know people are still filtering in um, so but yeah let's kind of get things started here so before we turn it over to Juan and his excellent excellent presentation a couple of announcements things to talk about um, I just got word that there are a bunch of training sessions. Uh, how many people, for those of you that remember the uh, Adobe World that we had last year, that was pretty awesome. Um, I just got word that there are a whole new group of training sessions coming up, three of them in particular. Um, and I should have written the details down to tell you about all of them. And today completely got away from me and I don't have all the information in front of me. So. I will post all of it up to Facebook uh, and the meetup page tomorrow. Um, I believe we are gonna get some, some passes to raffle off to go to these events. So um, we'll do that at a future meeting. Um, <laughs> yes, depending upon your point of view, that could be, um, Marcy. Um, but yeah, so I will get you all that information and, uh, and, and post that up on Facebook. And then at future meetings, we will talk about it a little bit more and we will actually raffle off some of the passes. So for those of you that um, didn't go to the Adobe world uh, for Premiere Pro and After Effects last year, that was actually, I have to say, really surprised me. It was a really great uh, meet, a set or a seminar. Um, a lot of the sessions were just way better than I thought they were gonna be. Um, so I was very surprised at how good it was. So I would highly encourage to uh, look at, at these uh, different events and give it some thought. So, and DJ, you went to the After Effects ones, didn't you? What, yeah, I went to the After Effects ones and a lot of the social stuff and both were actually really good. I mean, this like it was it was well put together. I kind of thought the social side of thing because they kept, kept pushing that too. And I, I kind of thought that was going to be hokey, but that was really good. I mean, you went into these breakout sessions, chatted to some people, uh, made some good connections and the classes themselves, um, you know, were really good. And the nice thing is a lot of the people that are teaching the classes, are teaching classes elsewhere too. And so they can kind of let you know where you can find out more and you know, a lot of stuff like that, so. Yeah, it's really pretty amazing. So yeah, if you have the opportunity to go to any of these, I would highly recommend it. And like I said, I, I apologize for not having all that information, but I will get it up on the Facebook page tomorrow for each of the three events. Um, I don't know the cost, but again, I will try to figure all that out and, and relay all that to all of you, but highly recommend them. Um, they are really, really good. And like I said, future meetings next month, month after we'll have passes. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure she said there were passes to raffle off. So we'll, we'll make sure we get you some passes um, uh, to those. Um, I, I, I got an up or, a, you know, Facebook is so nice to send you those, you know, memory things. And I got one about AB5, uh, about our AB5 meeting last year. And while I don't have any new updates on AB5, uh, for those of you um, here in California, who know what I'm talking about, I wish I did. Um, I am gonna try to find out some information, to get some information about the bills that have been to amend it and see if that has any kind of impact on us. And I'm hoping to post up something on Facebook or, or put together some little video that kind of gives an update on where things are at with that law. I don't think it's anything really good that has really come to pass, but there might be some improvements or things that might sort of help us, but just to kind of keep you all in the loop for those of you that are concerned about AB5 and, and you know, having to deal with that, um, I'll try to get you an update on that. Um, beyond that, I don't think I have any other announcements and I want to let Juan get going because he told me about what this meeting, what he was going to present and holy crap, it sounds like a lot of awesome stuff. So I don't want to waste any more time. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Juan. For those of you who don't know who Juan is, he is probably one of the finest color graders that uh, I know. Um, he and I, at some point in the near future, will be taking over the duties of Crossfire on CNN, if you follow us both on Twitter. <laughs> um, and, but no, he is going to give us a 
what I'm sure is going to be an amazing talk on color grading. And, and when I talked to Juan about this ahead of time, I told him that, you know, I didn't want to have another meeting because we've done these in the past where it's really about just what button to push, you know, and, and how to make things do like almost like a tutorial in Resolve or, you know, in Premiere using the metric of, of just how to do things. It's really more about the art of it. Like, you know, where do you start when you start, when you sit down and you look at an image and, and, and a shot and, and a sequence about how to get the mood? And I mean, just where do you start in even thinking about it? And so I think he's put together something that's going to be really amazing and beneficial for everybody. So without further ado, I'm going to, and I'll let Juan introduce himself because again, I forgot to have his bio in front of me. Obviously, I was explaining to Juan ahead of time. I had the, we had the kids broke a plant. I cut my finger right before I left to come back to the office to do this. So today was just kind of crazy. So I'll let Juan introduce himself and Juan, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you uh, guys for having me. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here as always. Uh, well, pleasure to be anywhere, but these days. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just turn my screen share actually on my other uh, computer here and so I can actually um, kind of uh, walk you through guys. I have a couple of slides prepared and I wanna also give you guys a little kind of um, lowdown on what I do. So. My name is Juan Salvo, as a lot of you know. Um, I'm the CEO and finishing artist of Color Space. So we're actually in kind of my studio now. Um, we're a, a post-production finishing facility here in New York City. And so we do a lot of um, kind of, uh, I would say high-end uh, image enhancement, finishing, polish, beauty work, a little bit of VFX, that kind of stuff uh, in, for commercials and films and documentaries and um, various different um, levels of uh, tiers of product uh, projects. Um, so you can imagine that we touch a little bit on uh, kind of the image and uh, beauty and making things look great uh, quite a bit. And we spend a lot of time um, kind of um, working on that. And so Eric sort of uh, suggested to me that we should have this um, presentation and, and kind of make it something that's much more focused on the art of the process as opposed to like the craft of the process. And I thought that was a great idea and that's something I wanted to kind of share with you guys. Um, so, I mean, the first thing that kind of popped into my head when we came up with this thing was like the idea of like, you know, ultimately what is art? Um, we talk a ton, I've talked a ton about uh, color grading and color correction and uh, these kind of crafts. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a distinction between craft uh, versus art. In my mind, um, you know, the idea of uh, something being art is really about applying a craft with design, with intent, with meaning and significance behind it. Um, you can be a great craftsman, you can be an excellent, uh, um, uh, you know, a drywall fixer. And, uh, and that is a craft and a skill and, and there's uh, detail and work and practice that goes into it. And there's good uh, people who do, you know, uh, drywall and there's bad and less talented people who do drywall. The process itself is a form of craft, but no one would call that a work of art unless you were building a drywall with a purpose, with a message, with meaning, with significance, with import. Um, and so fundamentally, I think that that's what, that's what that distinction is to me. And that's kind of how I wanted to approach this conversation today. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys um, kind of through the process of, of how we grade things. Um, and a lot of that is gonna be about craft. It's gonna be about like, here are these buttons and here's uh, how we push these colors or look at or evaluate these things, look at the scopes in this way. Um, it's really hard to talk about that art um, uh, concept, right? It's really hard to talk about the sort of subtext of why you're using certain tools or how you're using those tools. Um, but I'm gonna try my best to kind of tie that together as we talk through a few things. Um, and, and maybe you can kind of, you'll have to kind of read between the lines a little bit of some of the things that I do to hopefully pick up on that. I don't want you to take um, anything we do today in a kind of literal prescription uh, kind of way. I know a lot of you guys are, are um, much more premiere focused. I'm gonna be working in Resolve a little bit, uh, but I want you to think about all of the things that we talk about as things you could apply elsewhere. You can apply them in After Effects, you can apply them in Photoshop, you can apply them in Premiere, you can apply them in Lightroom, in F Final Cut Pro, in whatever applications you might be using. The idea here is to get, what I want you to gleam here is techniques and the reasoning behind those techniques. Um, so to that end, there are basically three levels to modern grading. 
You know, we have the, the very uh, basic technical level of like shot matching and shot balancing, which I'm sure you guys are uh, very familiar with and can be kind of taxing for people. There's also like the idea of like shot evaluation, shot improvement, like actually looking at a shot and framing it in a better, better way, shaping how the audience looks at the shot, shaping how they see it, making the shot look its best. And then lastly, and the last thing we're gonna talk about is the idea of look creation and look adaptation. How, um, you know, we particularly if you look at kind of online talk about color grading, a lot of it is focused around looks and LUTs and, you know, borrowing looks and taking the look and this look works for that situation. And I want you to think about, hopefully come away from this uh, uh, talk with a little bit of a different appreciation on what, what it means to be a look, what a look is, um, and, uh, and how we go about kind of adapting looks and applying looks. We're gonna do a couple of examples of that. Um, I'm gonna jump into um, another timeline here and just kind of bring up some material. I have some shots, it's always tricky to um, get material that you can kind of use in these sorts of presentations. So um, I have, these are a few shots that I kind of took from a, um, a, a pilot that we did a while ago. Um, that's a great project by a, a, a director who's a friend of mine. And um, and these are all in like Sony S-Log and, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of, um, you know, uh, different color spaces and how that works. Uh, in a bit. Um, what I wanted to show you was basically talk a little bit about kind of the big um, uh, big picture issues that we face with footage uh, like this. So one of the things I see people doing sometimes is actually really looking at footage in the log format and kind of a, trying to evaluate it in the log format, which is always kind of a, um, I think a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, and so they'll look at flat, uh, shots that are flat like this, where maybe you won't see such huge differences from one shot to the next, um, as opposed to looking at it underneath the transform LUT or graded to 709, where, which really kind of maximizes that contrast and allows you to really see uh, much more clearly that those shots are changing over time. This is probably one of the big things you guys will run into in your productions, right? One of the biggest issues I have is stuff that's shot with natural light. Essentially, when you're talking about shot balancing and shot matching, you know, there's a few things that kind of feed into problematic uh, issues in that, you know. Uh, you know, one is obviously natural light changes, you know, technical issues with a camera, somebody changing white balance or maybe changing exposure during a shot or in between shots. Um, and then, you know, uh, pick up shots that might be at a different location or from uh, something that's entirely out of place, um, you know, or Franken scenes that are kind of cut from um, various different uh, location shoots or um, stuff you might run into where something shot with just a different camera. And so you have a different log format or a different camera format um, kind of uh, built into it. And those are the big um, kind of uh, the four big things that feed into uh, shot matching problems that we run into. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about kind of one one of these examples. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much into these just because I, we have a lot to get through. But you know, I have, for example, uh, this is what actually happened on this shoot. We had a, a situation where this actor is in front of a uh, open window. This, in fact, this very window right here. Um, they have shot uh, all of these reversals during kind of the brightest part of the day. By the time they got to the flip side of it, it was later in the day, heading into night, in fact. And there were some big, I don't know if you guys can see it on your screens here, but there were some big differences in terms of color temperature. You know, this is quite a bit cooler versus this, which is quite a bit warmer, uh, and exposure. Some of these things got much brighter, some got much darker. Um, so when we're tackling these things, you know, on a scene like this, what I'm looking for is to try to find a, a reference shot, a shot that I can kind of make everything else fit to. In this particular case, I do have some clipping in some of the backgrounds. Um, I'm taking selects that are not necessarily the stuff that was used in the cut, but so some of these things are more overexposed than they were in the actual show. But I want to find a reference point that's going to give me something that I can kind of, that's attainable in all of the shots, right? That's going to be like my go-to reference for where exposure should be. So, you know, a shot like this, I'm seeing a little bit of clipping in the background. I see good exposure on the skin. I don't see a lot of clipping in the shadows. This is probably going to be kind of that sweet middle, you know, tier for exposure for the scene. So I would want to take a shot like this or a shot like this and try to bring it into that world a little bit, right? Um, so how do we evaluate that? 
when we're looking at um, shot matching like this, in I, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something that uh, seems like the long way around here a little bit, but it's actually what we, what we do as colorists constantly, just almost subconsciously, and that is we essentially split the shot into two different components: the luminance, the dynamic range, and the exposure of the shot and then the color balance, the white balance, the color of the shot, the colorimetry of it. So um, in the, given in this case, I have uh, say, I think it was this shot was gonna be my reference. I'm just gonna grab a frame here. Actually, I'm gonna put it over here. And I wanna kind of match exposure more or less uh, to that on this scene, let's say, or actually let's take this scene, it's a little bit darker. Uh, I'm gonna uh, bring it up and just pull it, play it as a still just to have it as reference. I can kind of look and see that the skins are much darker, much cooler here. I'm going to just focus on the on the tone, on the uh, exposure. So what I'm going to do as a kind of um, long way around uh, is actually turn on just black and white. So I've just made this image black and white. I'm going to go back to my reference and I'm going to make this one black and white too, just to have it just for you guys. So I'm going to grab that still. And so now I'm going to come back over here. Was it, it was the shot? Okay, so now I can look and see and compare just in black and white. I'm just looking in black and white. How far off am I in terms of the skin? And from there, I can say add another node. I'm going to just kind of raise up the exposure and adjust my contrast a little bit. Let me see if I can find contrast and kind of find a way to just using those pivot and contrast adjustments. You see how I'm getting the skin more into a place where it sort of matches our other reference. You guys seeing that, right? So the skin goes from a little duller, a little darker, a little brighter, a little poppier, a little more contrast there. And all I did was I took the exposure up, I adjusted the contrast up a little bit and I brought the pivot down. So what that gives me is just that luminance level is now looking in the ballpark. So with that done, I can turn this off and now I can see actually how far off my color is. And I can look at this shot and look at this shot and I can say, well, it's a little bit warmer than what I like, but not too much warmer. So I'm gonna add one more node here. And it's more that it's kind of too warm in the shadows, I think, and you're expecting a little bit of coolness in the highlights. Although there is some kind of, there is a little pinkiness in the skin. So let's um, let's adjust that. Let's adjust for a little bit of the pinkiness in the skin. So we're gonna go and take some of the pinkiness out. Something like that, let's say here. And we're gonna just kind of adjust this a little bit here. And now we're getting a little bit more consistency. Uh, maybe it's a little blue. I'm just gonna take a little blue out. This is very hard to do on a laptop, by the way. All right, so we're taking a little blue out there. Gonna take a little pinkiness out of the mids. And I'm getting something, I would say quite a bit closer. The big difference here is that there is warm practical lights in the background here, really warming up the scene. And there are there's a cool daylight here, kind of really cooling off the scene. So here we get into a little bit more of us kind of aesthetic decisions about how we kind of treat the shot. Um, and so in a scene like this, for example, I might really decide that, you know what, I need to kind of take that, some of those um, uh, warm tones and just make them a little less present. So I'm just gonna take those kind of reds and just bring them down a little bit, something like that. I don't wanna really touch the skins and I don't wanna touch too much else. So I do a little bit of that. And that gets you, let's see here, so I'm gonna turn this off and jumping from this shot to this shot. That gets me into a world where those two shots kind of maybe make sense together. Right? So just to quickly kind of um, repeat myself here a little bit, I have another shot. It's the same angle. It's the same performance. It the The iris has opened up or something has changed. It is significantly brighter than the uh, reference shot at this point. So I wanna make sure that I do that same process here to match up these shots. Again, I'm gonna take my reference frame here. This is where I wanna end up. I'm gonna 
uh, go through and say, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I can just actually just grab this uh, image. So I'm just going to grab, sorry, uh, grab this. Let me just shrink that. Grab this guy. I'm going to turn on the uh, monochrome again so I don't see the color. I'm going to grab that still. I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to play this still again. So I'm looking at the monochrome image of both actors. Well, I will be shortly. Great. I can see that clearly in terms of luminance, he's way too bright. I'm going to go over here, go with my offset, bring that down. To about there. You can, if you um, don't feel too comfortable eye matching with something like this, where you literally have the same content on both, both sides of the frame, you know, you can use the waveform. So I can, you know, kind of bring that waveform over there. I can see where that split is. And I'm really damn close. Here's my, are you guys able to see my mouse? Yeah, you are. Here's my little peak of the waveform for one side. Here's the peak of the other. It's really, really close. So I can just go and dial it in till it's just right on that line. And so you can see that the, the skins there are almost perfectly aligned. I'm gonna turn off my black and white. Uh, go back over to, um, give me one second here. Go back over here, turn this off. I wanna see it in color. I'm gonna grab this still, play this still and then come back over here. And now I can see, okay, well, we are way off in terms of color temperature and tonality. So it's very, very pink compared to what that needs to be. And this one, I can just kind of ride into there. Let's see. Something like that. Oops. You'll have to bear with me a little bit because this is very hard to do with a mouse. All right, so we end up with something, let's call that in the ballpark. And lastly, of course, we're gonna have that warmth, the crazy warmth back here, which we dealt with separately in other iteration of this. So again, we can go through and go hue versus sat. I'm gonna pick out those colors and then just bring down the saturation for those a little bit. And so now we have something that is in the ballpark there, it, obviously, I you know I'm being a little rough here because I'm trying to get through it quickly. But you guys get the idea here that we can be in the ballpark um, in terms of shot matching, in terms of shot balance between those two shots. Um, so the just to recap, what I'm showing you here, the process is really about uh, in terms of evaluation, it is about two separate things: luminance and chrominance. It is about um, kind of identifying what the problems are in terms of shot matching. So I'm seeing, okay, the exposure has gone up or down, or more light uh, is hitting or missing the, the screen. And there are inconsistencies in the color balance because it's daylight, because the color temperature has changed. And so I'm anticipating those color temperature changes. I'm also looking out for, oh, there's practical lights in the background here that are turned on that are gonna change the tonality. And then I'm making an aesthetic decision about how do we mitigate that? How do we deal with it? How do we make that part of the scene? I see Marcy or Marshall asked a question. Why didn't you just copy all the notes and adjust the ex exposure? I could have, except that as, uh, I'll show you very quickly. Um, you know, the problem is really that in this grade, in this shot, it's not the same color temperature. The issue is not just that the exposure has changed, but the color temperature has changed as well. So I'm gonna just uh, create a new uh, grade here and I'm just copying over, all I'm doing now is just copying over the exact grade that I had on the other shot. So it's got that exact same grade. And then I can go through and go to my exposure tab and just bring down the exposure down a bit. And you know what, it's not looking too bad. Um, you know, I can kind of, uh, let's see here. I'm just gonna play this still and Bring it over here and then I can kind of write it by eye a little bit and something like that. It's not terrible in this case, but it is a little bit off in terms of the color temperature because the, there is a color temperature difference. You can see that kind of in their in their skin and in the in the background, it's a little warmer, a little poppier on the reds. Um, and and that's because, like I was saying, what we have here is a natural light situation. That natural light is just changing and dynamic 
you know, you're shooting something for five hours over the course of that five hours, uh, you know, the, 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 the tone of the daylight is going to have changed. Um, any other questions? So you guys feel free to chime in, in the chat. Uh, I know I'm going through a lot. And what I'm, what I'm really trying to focus on here is not so much like the minutia of uh, here, are the uh, individual components, but what I really am trying to communicate and hopefully it's coming across is what the kind of the thought process is as I'm looking at those shots, how I'm evaluating those shots. Um, so, um, you know, coming back to these evaluations, when we're when we're doing that sort of, and and I and I I'm doing it literally by going into black and white to show you guys in black and white. Here's how we adjust the luminance. Here's how we adjust the tonality. Um, I don't actually go into black and white most of the time when I'm doing the grade, but I'm doing that in my head. In my head, I'm kind of you know I'm looking at that waveform, and this is what's tricky, right? Because if you look at the waveform in color and the color balance is different. Um, so if the color balance goes really green or something, then the waveform is going to line up differently. And so if you're trying to, if I'm trying to ride in the skin tone in the waveform with the color temperature being different from one shot to another, uh, or for example, from, you know, my reference shot over here to this shot over here, I'm going to, I'm in doing that, I'm going to kind of hit a wall because I'm going to be fighting the color balance and the luminance balance at the same time. And they're really two separate things. So even though I may not literally, when I'm working with a client, go through and make the shot black and white, in my head, I'm kind of making my calculus. And, and what I'm saying is that you can, until you get that kind of comfort level with it, you can totally, you know, and you should totally make the effort to go through and make the shot black and white, evaluate that exposure, get the luminance level lined up, and then look at color, then look at tonality and look at the color balance. And it's gonna get you a lot closer, a lot faster in that sense. Um, so we use um, my personal preference and, and you can use a lot of different things. So I could look for, it, when I'm trying to figure out like what, what do I look for in the frame in order to match from one shot to another? You can very easily, for example, on a shot like this, where we're going from a wide to a tight, we could very easily um, go through and, you know, match objects that are in both shots. So if I'm trying to match this shot and this shot and this shot, I can look at the background, look at his skin, look at his sweater. I have a lot of commonality between those shots. It's a little bit harder when you're trying to grade a whole scene and you're trying to make a whole scene work and you have shots that don't have common elements or have very few common elements or have common elements from different angles or with different lighting. Um, so that isn't necessarily what I go for when I'm trying to shop, shop balance and shot match. I will look for, particularly for the exposure, I will look, as you watch me do, at skins. Skins are a pretty good guide. So generally speaking, when a DP is shooting a scene or when we're, or when the audience is watching a scene, we're looking for that, those skins to be, you know, fairly well lit, to be visible, to be defined. And so it's a good reference for where that kind of, you know, middle tier exposure should be. And that can be a really good guide to where you should drive your exposure from one shot to another. So you saw me do that there where I went black and white and I literally lined up the skins and I looked at where the skins were and I got those waveforms to sort of match up with the skins. Um, uh, it's a good reference point for that kind of stuff. And then once I've done that, again, I'm doing this mentally when I'm doing it myself. Once I've done that, then I'll go through and look for a reference for white. And in this case, I don't really have a reference for white because I have this very warmly lit um, background. Uh, you know, we have a reference for white in the other shots and that we have some overexposed stuff in the background that should be white. Um, so, I, I, you know, in this case, it's a little bit trickier. I'm, I use the balance of the skin to kind of drive it more than the white balance per se. But, you know, there's a card there. I could have used that as my kind of white reference. There's a little card in the frame. You can usually find a shot, particularly if you're looking at mm, when you do well, work with documentaries a lot, you'll have just, you know, interview shots that are exist in an island. They're not meant to be part of an overall scene. And you want to kind of grade them to where they feel fluid and can kind of work smoothly with other things. It's good to have that kind of white reference, the white component, what is white in the scene. And that can be a good way to drive you into figuring out what the color temperature of the scene should be or what, or what the color balance issues for the scenes are. Um, I had a question here from Bob Unger. He asked, how long does it take to make it perfect? When is it good enough? 
your eye is trained. Most audiences are not that start discriminating. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's never perfect. Um, it's never perfect um, because uh, one of the problems is, is we'll get into is a lot of it is subjective and it's not a matter of like, you know, is there a technical perfection? Um, I think, I personally think it's kind of good enough when I feel like even somebody who's relatively discerning in the audience is not going to be distracted by it. It doesn't need to be, you know, uh, if I if I fixate on a shot, I can maybe still find differences. I'm not going to worry excessively about those things. One of the things that we do as professional colorists that I do all the time is we need to work really quickly. That's why I'm talking about like, uh, you know, in my head, I'm going black and white. If I actually went through and made every shot black and white balance and did all that, it would take me a very long time to get through shots. So I understand the, the issue of the concern about the time it takes. Um, as you get used to these things, you go faster. And so you can evaluate the shot faster, you figure out what it needs faster, and you can kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, get it to a good enough place relatively quickly. And then I always watch things back and I, I try to watch things back in context. And then in context, you can see if things jump out at you and look off and you, you know, you fix those. Have you ever corrected something to the wrong color because the shots would match better? Yes. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let me come back to that, Marcy. Um, but did you start out making the shots black and white first and then trust your eye later? Jackie asks if I started out making the black, the shots black and white first and trust your eye later. Yes, I definitely did. And I also definitely, when I was starting out, I made a lot of mistakes where it worked through things the hard way a lot. I think it's useful to do that. Um, but, you know, I, I think that I spent, there, uh, when I was starting out, I would spend a lot of time forcing myself to not make the shots black and white in order to develop the skills. And then inevitably, particularly with tricky shots, I would I would get my myself into a corner, find myself very frustrated, start the grade over, make it black and white, and then get to a much better place getting making it black and white. And eventually, you do that enough and it gets to the point where you very rarely need to make the shot black and white to kind of see what's going on. Um, okay, let's talk about, uh, uh, to get um, to um, Marcy's point a little bit and also to kind of uh, get to the bigger picture. Uh, let's talk about shot evaluation. Um, so, you know, one of the things um, uh, that, you know, I think separates shot evaluation from shot matching, shot uh, balancing, is that when you're shot matching and shot balancing often, you're not really making subjective decisions. We made a little bit of subjective decision about the how we handled the warm light in the background there. Um, uh, but we, you're not generally making subjective decisions. You're just trying to get the sort of technical decisions out of the way. You're trying to get the color balance to match and the exposure to match. And you're trying to have the scene feel uh, fluid or feel have the content feel fluid. So get things that are uh, outliers back into where you want them to be. When you're talking about shot evaluation and, and shot improvement, um, you're really talking more, much more about the kind of the aesthetic experience of what the shot looks like, how you're seeing it, how the audience is seeing it. And so one of the key things, one of the key lessons that I uh, have learned over the years uh, is kind of figuring out what audiences are gonna look at first. There was a study done and I actually tried to find, uh, there's a great video of this study uh, that I, I wasn't able to find with a Google search this afternoon. But um, uh, there was a study done where they actually used um, these kind of like infrared cameras to figure out where people's eyes were looking at in a, in a screening session. So they showed people like movies, like scenes from movies, and they would like actually superimpose with the data they got from the camera with the infrared camera uh, onto, the, onto the image. So they could figure out where people's eyes were actually on the image. And so um, this study has this great footage of like, I think it seems from like, uh, there will be blood or something uh, where people are watching the scenes and you're seeing as the shot change, these dots that show where the person's looking. And so you can see where the audience's eyes and attention are going from one shot to the next, one shot to the next. And one pattern that becomes really apparent very quickly is the first thing we wanna look at is people's faces and expressions, their eyes, their lips. That's what we're drawn to. But if we don't have a clear sense of where the person is, our eye is immediately drawn to whatever the brightest thing in the scene is. So when we're doing this kind of shot evaluation, the thing we're trying to do and where we get into a little bit more of an artistic purpose here is serve the story, figure out what the audience needs to see, figure out what the audience's um, you know, focus should be. And then 
look at ways to shape the shot to you know make it easiest on the audience the audience shouldn't have to fight you to figure out what it needs to look at in a shot so i'll give you a quick example here um you know uh let's say we have a scene like this you know we have this shot uh, it's a guy, he's kind of from behind, he's backlit. This feels maybe a little bit too bright uh, for what the scene should be. It's maybe a little bit more noir-ish. Um, but uh, the first thing you're going to kind of look at when you're looking at the shot is kind of this thing here. It's the, the Chevron, you know, gas station sign. It's going to draw your eye. It has the most color. It has the most brightness. So, you know, it's, you never want to make the solution uh, worse than the than the problem. So I wouldn't want to, for example, just like desat this and get rid of all the color and make it black and white or really bring it down. But I want to work in subtleties and subtle ways to kind of shape the way the audience is going to look at the shot. So one thing I would do is um, I look at this and I see a lot of like uh, high uh, frequency information here, a lot of this crunchiness and detail in this area that it can be very kind of interesting and has a lot of uh, kind of uh, texture to it. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things. One, I'm going to just expose the shot down because I feel like the shot should be a darker shot, particularly this part here feels too bright, this whole area here. So I'm going to add another, I'm going to add a shape here and I'm just going to do a, uh, a little feathered thing. By the way, I just want to say that I'm working through the shot live. I, it's not like I, this was not a planned, I'm not planning what I'm going to do with this shot or I haven't looked at, I looked at the shot. I was like, okay, we're going to work on the shot and now I'm working it through it, through it live with you. So I may do things and go, no, let's, uh, let's not do that. Let's try something else. Um, just so you know, just so you can kind of see the process as that actually works out. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to add this, this, uh, this tool inside of um, resolve is the, Oh, I forget what they call it, the gradient uh, window, which is just like, all it does is it creates a little grad. Um, so it creates a little, like a little uh, gradiated mask. Um, and so it's really handy for shaping because you can kind of very easily, it's almost like a grad filter on a lens, you know, you can very easily kind of shape things. And so I can use this to kind of like shape this a little bit here. I'm just gonna adjust, you know what I wanna keep? I want to keep high contrast around him, right? So I want a little bit of this highlight kind of coming around his leg, giving you a little a little pop there. It's really going to draw the eye. That's what, you know that silhouette is going to draw the eye. So I want to keep that contrast there, but I don't want it to be feel too forced, and I definitely don't want you know want to be looking at this car. So with that in mind, I'm going to add another layer here. I'm going to say add another parallel. Uh, I'm just adding a parallel just because it's easier than building one serial after another, but uh, I'm not going to go into kind of the differences too much with within Resolve, but it doesn't matter. I want you know, guys to adapt this stuff anyway. So I'm going to just do a little window here. And all I want to do here is just, I'm just going to bring this down even more. This is a little bit like you would do in Photoshop, like dodge and burn, right? Like you're, I'm kind of dodging and burning areas. I'm figuring areas that I don't want to see, areas that I do want to see. And so already with just those two changes, I've really kind of made the shot much more about him, uh, even though we're going to do a little bit more, I've already kind of drawn the eye quite a bit, quite a bit. So I'm going to add another uh, parallel node and I'm going to add another window here. And now I'm just going to get rid of some of this color in the, sh in the uh, gas station thing. So particularly, oh, I'm just going to do this and this. Particularly, I'm worried about the reds and the blues. So I'm going to go through and pick my hue versus sat and I'm just going to pick those blues and bring those down a little bit and pick the reds and bring those down quite a bit. Something like that. So it's still got color, but it's not so much color that it's like popping and glaring. And that's good enough for me. Uh, I'm gonna do uh, one other thing here. I'm gonna add another parallel. I'm gonna go in here and I'm just gonna do a little shape, kind of particularly I'm interested in like the area between his back and this wall where there's some co potential for contrast, create a little soft shape there. And I'm just gonna bring up the contrast in that area a little bit. So I'm bringing up the gain and I'm gonna bring down the lift. So it's just creating a little contrast in that area. And that does a lot to draw the eye. So now you're really looking at him. I could 
you know, if I wanted to go above and beyond here, I'm going to make this a little bigger so you guys can see. And I'm actually going to get rid of this scene and definitely get rid of that. And I'm going to get rid of this. Okay, good. Um, if I wanted to, I could do a little bit more um, with like a softer kind of silhouette-y, sorry, a vignette-y uh, soft focus. So I'm just going to take this and make it really big, really round, and really soft. And I'm going to take the outside of this. So I'm just affecting the outside of the edge of the scene here. And I'm going to go through and use my um, mist tool. So mist tool is kind of, it's meant for to do like skin softening. So the way I use it is I kind of like en enhance the kind of um, edges. So you can see like all the, all the detail and edges here get really poppy and then mix those out and it actually blurs those. So it does something a little bit like a uh, mist filter uh, my in, in lens. So I'm just doing that just to reduce some of the high frequency information on the outside there. And just, again, all of this is about driving focus, driving the eye. The hope is what I would like to do is set something up where the audience is not looking at the areas that I'm affecting. They're looking at the areas that I'm trying to get them to pay attention to. And so that so that even though we're do, we're doing a fair bit to the shot, like we have done a fair bit of um, affecting to the shot, and I haven't, by the way, changed color tone. I haven't changed, you know, the well, I've changed the exposure a little bit, but I haven't really changed the tone of the shot. All I've done here is a is what I would call shaping. I have shaped where your eye is drawn, where you're focusing in the shot, where your the audience's attention is being directed in the shot. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm going to add a new version of this and reset this and then show you before and after. So you can see we have done quite a bit to drive the tone of that shot. Um, I had, let's see, I have a question here. Uh, I, oh, somebody found a movement on eye articles. Wonderful. Um, but did you start out making the shot like my first? Oh, that's your, uh, was that related to this section or related to that? Oh, that was earlier. That was Sorry, before. Jack. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's um, a, a good example of sort of how we draw, how we make decisions about shaping and and what what my mindset is as I'm kind of evaluating those shots. Inevitably, when I'm looking at shots, I want to do kind of as little as possible. I don't want to be overdriving every single shot. I'm really looking at in terms of context for the shot, in terms of the story for the shot. Is there something about the shot that's taking the audience out of the moment, that is taking something away? Can we reduce that effect? Can we make things feel more fluid? And to get to uh, the question that Marcy asked earlier, some, do you ever make something the wrong color because it would match better? Uh, absolutely, uh, we do. We, we will make things, if a shot is, uh, uh, it's possible, for example, for a shot to be too pretty so you can have one shot in a scene that's just stunningly beautiful and looks outstanding and it makes the other shots look worse and it or it becomes distracting you see the beautiful shot and then you're like oh, beautiful shot and you get out of the moment in the scene it can happen at an inopportune time and so uh yes uh very frequently we'll make decisions um, in a case, in the case of like the scene we were working on earlier, we had these clipped highlights in a lot of the shots, and if you go from one shot to another, and all the 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 same uh, object in the background goes from being clipped to not clipped from one shot to the next, it could be distracting. The audience is willing to accept that you have clipped highlights. Our eyes kind of see that way anyway, but they're unwilling to accept that like at one moment it's clipped and then another moment it's not. That's a little weird. So in the case of that scene, I remember in the actual scene when we did it, uh, we had one take where the we actually clipped the highlights uh, in post in order to make them feel more cohesive and feel fluid with the rest of the takes that were from that scene, from that same shot. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, look over my notes here. Uh, so we talked about the eye, eye tracking. You know, um, oh, okay. One thing I want to talk about a little bit here is... Um, uh, how we look at the shot. Uh, one of the things that happens 
I, you, you can tell um, when I've been working through this shot, one thing I've been doing is like zooming in, zooming out, kind of moving around. And uh, one of the things that happens uh, when you're looking at a shot is, particularly if you're on a, a bigger screen, or you're close to the bigger screen, you can kind of lose sight of the context of the whole frame. And I do think that that's really important. So I will inevitably, even though I will work on a shot in kind of close up form, when I'm evaluating the shot, I wanna get further out. So I will actually like zoom out the shot, look at it a little bit smaller, in fact, Looking at it in thumbnail, you can really tell what's going on in a shot, whether a shot's working or what the focus is in a shot. If you're looking at a thumbnail and you can tell what's going on or what the subject of that shot is, I think that's a good thing. That's a good sign in my book. And so I like to be able to do that. I like to be able to kind of have a visual, a visual language that's so clear in the shot that even at a little small scale, a thumbnail scale or a, th a stamp scale, you're able to look at it and see, okay, here's what's happening. In this case, this shot's very tricky. But, you know, um, the problem is that, uh, you know, or, or actually what I've been getting at here is actually trying to find ways to make a shot that is busy and kind of uh, has a lot going on. So here's the shot ungraded just to look at it, you know, on a small scale, right? Here's the shot ungraded in thumb some thumbnail form. Their brightest part is here on the sidewalk. Your kind of eye, your eye is drawn to that area. Your eye is drawn more to the car and this gas station than it is to the guy. And then after we've done our grade, you know, it's still a little hard to tell what's going on because it's mostly a silhouette and it's kind of dark shot. But at least I feel like we get our eye drawn much more towards this area, much more towards that area of high contrast and high frequency information that has, you know, the silhouette of the man's um, uh, chest. Um, so looking at it small can be really helpful. Um, you know, evaluating kind of what the, what is going to draw the eye is really important. You know, you might, for example, uh, you know, have a shot, you know, a shot like this, you know, what's important here is like we're seeing him in the in the frame uh actually let me zoom in and see you guys can see uh we're seeing him kind of walk into the frame uh, through the window and then walk through the door right so it's important that we see him really clearly in the window the stuff that's happening here and here is not particularly important so in a case like this for example i might want to like you know add uh some of these uh, uh gray grad filters to kind of maybe uh, bring this guy down a little bit. So I'm going to bring this down, something like that. Let's say, something like that. And similarly on this other side, so I can add another grad and do it over here and turn this thing around and make it a little softer, something like that. So just with that, right, we're focused much more on the door, but, you know, we could do even more I could make that um, kind of doorway and this background with a very soft window. Da -da. I can do something like, I wanna take those highlights. Whoops, I want this one. I wanna take those highlights. And I'm just gonna make sure I don't touch the, the door frame. So I'm gonna leave that locked off and I'm gonna raise this a little bit. And I just created a little contrast there. And so now, it's got a little more energy, a little more pop. And it just draws your eye a little bit more. So if we're going from that to that, we're just trying to get the audience to kind of focus in a little bit. Um, so I definitely want to, like I said, I definitely want to look at it wide. Uh, you, If it's possible in the scene, you want to make your subject the brightest part of the scene. Uh, it's not always the case that you can pull that off, but if you have shots, you know, something like this, you can pretty easily make the subject the brightest part of this part of the scene. I can very easily just bring down that background a little bit. And, you know, and, and, and then because this is kind of well art directed in the sense that like, you know, it's got a background that's not too boring, but it's also not distracting. And it's kind of shaped in a way that's already kind of drawing the eye towards the performance anyway. Um, you know, this makes it pretty easy. So in this case, I might just, for example, do a little bit of a soft window and just, just bring down the background a little bit, you know, just to shape it a little bit. And I think something like that, you know, he's immediately just really popping off that screen. 
And all I did there was just bring down the background of the hair, right? And I did it with a very soft vignette, with a very soft feather. I don't want to see a shape. I don't want to. I don't want the audience to feel like it's being directed. I just wanted to sort of subliminally just be the brightest part of the frame. Um, and and one thing to point out, and we did we did touch on this a little bit here uh, in this shot. Uh, but one thing to point out is that often one of the best ways to kind of shape uh, wh where the audience's attention is, is about removing colors. We did that a little bit in, in these shots over here, right? We took the, uh, we took the warmth down in the background that made the skins a little bit more, uh, you know, a little poppier in the scene. And, you know, you want to kind of, you want to kind of, when you're approaching a shot and you find, as is frequently the case, or I feel like it's frequently the case, particularly with stuff that's shot, that's like shot, on location, on set, or, or, or handheld, or cinema verite style, um, there's too many things going on. It's it's often the case there's just too many colors, there's too many variations of colors, and so often in those cases, the thing I'm spending the most time on, or the thing that I'm really fixating on in terms of this shot uh, uh, enhancement, is is actually bringing down the tones that I don't want the audience to care about too much. So focus on any project, I'm focused on, on a couple of colors. And that actually brings us to the next category, which is look look development and look adaptation. Um, you know, uh, I had a question here recently. Um, how much grading of footage do you do before it is selected for the edit or are you only grading after picture lock? Um, it depends. Um, the vast majority of our projects were grading after picture lock, but we're sometimes asked to kind of come in and, and evaluate things in the edit and make suggestions. So um, more often than not with our documentary clients, they'll have like, could we use this shot? Is this shot salvageable kind of questions? And we'll look at them and, and make um, help them make decisions about those things. Um, in terms of the narrative uh, stuff, it's actually a mixed bag. And uh, on a lot of the projects that we've worked on, we've gotten to do dailies and, and actually done the look development early on in either before production or early on in the shoot. Um, so we're actually kind of helping, helping them a little bit in terms of crafting what they're doing in terms of our direction on set. It helps a lot. I realize that for most people's projects, and I hope what I what I kind of give you guys today is stuff that you can apply in your projects. I realize for a lot of people's projects, that's just not possible. And so more often than not, the reality is you're dealing with stuff that's been already edited. We deal with a lot of commercial stuff, particularly now post COVID, that is like Franken, you know, Stein commercials where they've taken projects that they've worked on before and repurposed elements and combined them with other things and shot some original stuff. And so they're mixing and matching all these things. And we just got to make it work to the best of its capacity. Um, and so that's where these kind of techniques really pay off, you know, looking at things like, okay, how do we make the shot not distracting? How do we make the scene fluid, even though it's made from three different shoots that have been combined together. How do we make it feel fluid? Um, and then in terms of, as we're getting to look development here, how do we deal with themes, right? How do we develop themes for the piece? And every piece can have themes. Every piece has, you know, if you're dealing with branded content, you're, you're often dealing with like brand colors and brand identity stuff. But more importantly, I think even if you're dealing with, uh, you know, all, all tiers of production, you're dealing with like, somebody's trying to tell a story. Some There's something trying to be communicated. And that communication has a tone to it, has a theme to it. Is it high tech? Is it warm? Is it human? Is it funny? Is it relatable? Is it these things? That all has a color language and can be enhanced with like a color language. And so that's where we get into this idea of like look development and, and looks that we apply to films or looks that we apply to projects. Um, you know, uh, that really is uh, a core part of that is really about what colors you don't include. What do you take out of the scene? What's not part of the, of the shot? Um, let's, uh, let's look a little bit about, um, let's look into that a little bit um, in terms of uh, look adaptation, because this is something I do, um, I've kind of talked about before and I think might be kind of interesting. Uh, 
All right. So, um, so I, I, I uh, it's a little odd uh, doing these things where um, I don't, I'm used to like having audience interactions and I would like ask people like, how often do you guys do this? How often do you guys do that? Um, so I, I, I would imagine here uh, that um, for at least some of you, if you've done any color grading, you have had clients come to you uh, often with an idea that is way outside their budget in terms of how their piece should look. So they're like, I want it to look like Transformers or I want it to look like, you know, uh, uh, Hannibal or the, uh, the, the ha Handmaid's Tale. Um, I get that stuff with commercial stuff all the time. I get that stuff with clients. They'll come in with references and they'll have like lookbooks and they will have kind of well thought out ideas about what they're going for in terms of the look. And I'll be tasked with the idea of like adapting that look to the footage that they shot. So this happens um, all of the time. And, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the process of kind of doing that. And it actually harkens back to the stuff we've already talked about before. So when I'm looking at kind of references like this, you know, I will, uh, for example, let's say that somebody comes back and is like, I want it to look like Hannibal, right? And they'll bring me some stills from Hannibal and they'll be like, I like, you know, this scene and I like this, uh, this scene here, right? Let's, let's do, let's do this scene and this scene. Um, so uh, Hannibal is like, I, in terms of visuals, like one of my favorite shows, I absolutely love it. Um, but, you know, it has a really defin defined look. It's very distinctive. Um, you know, when I'm evaluating something like this, what I'll look for is I'll want to kind of come up with reference points that relate to the stuff, the material that I have. So, you know, I might, for example, look at something like this and then look at um, this shot that I have here and or here and I'll see, okay, well, I have some red tones uh, in the reference. I have some red tones in the frame here. I have some skins. I have a little bit of directional light in the scene. I have a lot of directional light in this scene in the cannibal reference. I have a little bit of like this column and wall tones uh, and I have some of that similar kind of reference inside of this scene. So this is a pretty good, this is a pretty good reference in terms of like copying over the look or applying the look um, from one to another. All right, great. So, you know, with that in mind, I will look at this in exactly the same way that I talked about uh, before in terms of uh, a shot matching. Look matching is kind of the same way. We're breaking it down to luminance uh, decisions and decisions about contrast and exposure and color decisions. In this case, decisions more about color tonality than color balance, let's say. So, um, you know, in this case, I can look at the reference and I can say, okay, well, we have quite a bit more contrast and density. The exposure falls in a different pl place. There's a lot more kind of, uh, particularly in the background, there's a kind of harsher roll off into the shadows, although it doesn't really go fully black. Um, it's a little harder for me in this context to do the black and white thing. So I'm going to skip that. But uh, suffice it to say, you could actually turn this black and white and then look in a black and white and make the evaluation. Um, so I'm going to just turn off the reference for a second. I'm going to make this uh, a little bigger so I can kind of have it handy. Uh, okay, so what I want to do here is I'm going to ride my levels a little bit. I want to kind of get density in the shadows, but no clipping. So I'm going to lock off my bottom end here. I'm going to lock off my mids around here. I'll fix those later. And I'm just going to find some density here, something like that. Uh, and then I'm going to look at a skin tones, look at a skin tones. There's a little, I want to make sure that I get uh, skin tones in the right place. So I'm just going to, I'm going to take a qualifier. I'm going to pick that. So here's where my skin tones are. I'm going to remove this. I'm going to raise that up a little bit. So you can see already I'm getting a little more contrast in the skins. I'm getting a little density. There's a vignette that we'll worry about later happening here. But I want to just kind of raise the highlights a little bit and do something like that. Great. Um, all right, so next thing is in terms of color balance here, this has a lot more, and I'm just gonna play this so we can look at it here. And you can see that this has a lot more warmth 
I'm gonna bring, I'm sorry, I'm gonna bring the shadows down just a hair. Whoops. So we got, there we go. So this, this has a lot, the Hannibal reference has a lot more warmth. I'm gonna add some warmth into here. And it's got a little bit of kind of coolness in the shadows. And I think like a little bit of like this, um, sorry, I tend to get really quiet when I start <laughs> tiling this stuff in. It's got a little bit of like a, a little bit of deset right in the shadows in the Hannibal reference. So I'm just gonna try to dial that in a little bit. I feel like I may have overdriven the blacks. So I'm just gonna ride the mids up a little bit, a little down here. Sometimes, by the way, I'm looking at the uh, kind of uh, details here. It's easy to get lose sight of the big picture. So it's important to kind of step back a little bit, you know, look at the whole frame of the reference, look at the whole frame of the shot you're matching, evaluate how close it is, come back, you know, look at it some more. Um, so I'm gonna add a little more warmth in here. And now, uh, let's see how that looks. I'm just gonna bring my reference over a little bit. And so I can look at that and that. And I see a little, I'm just gonna add a little mid-tone detail. There's a little kind of sharpness to the Hannibal reference that we don't have, unfortunately. And I think the last thing I'm seeing here is that there's a kind of dullness, almost oranginess to the reds that we don't have in our reds. Our reds are a little more poppy. So I'm just gonna quickly go through here and I'm gonna do hue versus hue. And I'm gonna pick those reds and I'm gonna make them a little more orangey. Something like that. And play that and look at the difference. And that looks pretty good. All right, so, so I took, uh, you know, my reference here and my grade here. And I could do a little bit more to like warm up the, the neutral. So if I wanted to like, you know, just kind of add a little, uh, kind of do a little selection to the low sat stuff and blur that out a little bit and then just add a little more warmth to it. I think that's kind of something that is in the, in the reference here, yeah. Are we in the ballpark? Are we kind of there? It's not a literal adaptation. I'm trying to take a figurative adaptation of it. I'm trying to get the kind of the essence of what makes that shot work and figure out a way to make it work in this other shot. Um, if you try to be really literal, you can kind of drive yourself into a wall because for example, you could have a scene that is a, a daylight scene and you're trying to develop the look from a night scene, it's not gonna work. You know, uh, you have to be a little figurative. You have to figure out a way to kind of abstract what is the, what are, what is the theme? What is the, what makes that look the look? You know, that level of contrast in the case of the Hannibal reference, you know, it's about a little bit of contrast. So I would, you know, I'd be able to adapt that pretty easily. It's about a little bit of warmth in the neutrals. It's about a particular shade of red and a particular kind of density of the red. Um, that gets you into that ballpark. Uh, you know, last thing I would add to this shot, you know, if I really wanted to sell the Hannibal look there is, you know, I think the Hannibal thing has a, uh, has kind of a vignette-y feel to it. And it's kind of, a lot of the Hannibal shots do that. So I would add something like, you know, a little shape kind of across, uh, oh, try to find something that works with the shot. But I, what I want to do is find a little way to create some, drama within the shot. So I would do a little shape here and bring this down a little bit more. So you get, you get like a little more, a little more drama in there. Um, OK, 
Cool. I, you know, I, when I used to, when I do things in person, every once in a while you get to a moment and people are like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then they like clap. And it's like it's, it's the lack of the uh, feedback. Is really it's, it's um, I hope really you guys, cool, man. I hope you guys are being entertained here. Um, and, I love and it. This is interesting. Um, okay. So, um, uh, good. So you get the idea here. What I'm trying to do, right, is kind of show you that thought process. And the way we kind of soft adapt things, it's not a literal adaptation, it's a figurative adaptation. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I guess we can do one more kind of, I think the shot matching thing is kind of fun, but let's do, um, let's do one more scene here and we can kind of do something kind of easier. I, I would say this is a pretty easy one. Um, you know, something like this, this is a pretty literal adaptation, right? So uh, in terms of how these things go, you know, we have, uh, fixtures in the background here. We have foreground actors. We have something that's relatively uh, dimly lit. Now, what I'm going to do in, in this uh, demo is not something that I would ever do in this scene because it would not work in the scene because the you've seen the reversal of the scene and how the scene works from one shot to another. So I'm just going to show you how I would adapt this look to this shot. I'm not trying to show you how I would adapt this look to this scene. If somebody brought me this as a reference for this scene, I would be like, Let's look at some other references from Mine Hunters because I don't think this reference is really built for this scene. And if they really insisted on it, then I would try and find ways to kind of adapt it. But it would not be a very literal adaptation. But I want to show you a, kind of a quickly, a quickie literal adaptation here. So I'm going to just quickly, I'm going to reset the reference size, the reference position. And so we can look at it and say, okay, well, in terms of contrast, we're not too far off. Like their exposure for skin's a little denser. They have a little more kind of, um, I would say, uh, mid-frequent, mid-tone detail in their skins. Um, but you know, I mean, exposure could be a little lower, I think. And their high, their highlights, you can really see the practical lights. And I think that's a big recurring theme on Mine Hunters and any of the Fincher stuff is like, the practical lights are very visible and very like clear. Um, so, all right, in terms of tonality, I mean, they're much more kind of desatted and greeny and they're doing some funky things there. So let's try and see what happens when we just go a little bit towards that greeny space. So something like that. All right. So, okay, so that, that's a, that feels a little bit better for the lighting. It doesn't feel great for his skin, but that's okay. I'm gonna do another parallel grade. I'm gonna qualify our actor's skin here. I'm gonna look at that qualification. I'm gonna try and make it kind of narrow. I'm gonna soften that up a little bit. Pull off the low, pull the high down a little bit. Okay. So when I'm doing this key, I see a lot of people like when they're starting out grading or when they're trying to grade and they're trying to get a perfect key if I'm doing something like skins and there's something in the background that's close enough to a skin and I'm not planning to do anything crazy to the skin, I don't need that key to be perfect. I'm fine with like affecting a couple of pixels in the background a little bit when I'm tweaking the skin a little bit. But what I wanna do is be, I wanna get 90% of the way in the overall grade and I want that skin tweak to just be like a little goose. You know, I don't wanna be doing a night and day difference. And in this case, it's gonna be a much more significant difference than what I would normally do in a skin tone, um, just because I'm trying to kind of match up this look, which is kind of a serious look. But, you know, what do I need? I need a little less of the kind of, you know, in the skins, I want a little bit of, less of the greeniness and a little more of the red, uh, something like that. And I just want overall, I want a little less color. So I'm gonna bring this out down a little bit. And then I'm just gonna bring this down a hair. And one thing that happened just there by bringing it down a little bit is you really see our actor's eyes come out, which looks really dramatic and cool, I think. But you can see that that maybe had too much of an effect. I can always dial it back. So I'll take the key output and just kind of dial it back a little bit. And I'm gonna soften up the selection a little bit more. And, you know, another thing that's happening here is we're getting this kind of mid-tone effect because 
what I'm doing is, a, you know, you can see around the eyes, I'm creating a little more kind of tonal contrast around the teeth, around the eyes. And it's kind of, it has a, like a sharpening effect, which is actually good for our look. Um, but it, you know, it's an effect. So, you know, it's something to be, keep in mind. So just looking at that, feels pretty good. I would say, you know, this is a relatively low res image, so I'm not gonna worry too much about how much, how little detail there is in the shadows, but I will say that like, there is a little bit of a shifted, a lifted shadow effect. So I'm just gonna kind of just do a little qualification on my shadows. You, I don't know if you guys are, the, those of you who are really paying attention will see that I'm, I'm sometimes using different techniques to kind of achieve the same thing. And, and that's true in, um, and it's not like there's a rhyme or reason necessarily. I just feel more com confident or comfortable or I'm closer to one control or another. But there's, uh, for almost all of these things, there's multiple ways to do it. And none, none of them are right or wrong per se. It's just like the circumstances might be better for one or another. So in this case, I'm doing a qualification. I could also kind of dial this in with levels. I just feel like in this context, because I'm using a mouse and I'm on a machine with like a weird resolution, I feel a little more comfortable with uh, qualifying and adjusting the wheels than I do like moving the curves around. But it's just, that's just, subjective, you know. Um, so I'm doing a little qualification there on the, on the deeper shadows and I'm just gonna lift up just a little bit just to get some of that kind of muddiness that we have in the reference. So reference muddy, uh, we have muddy. And again, I could dial this down a little bit if I wanted to. So you get something like that. And you know we have great looking practicals here. I don't feel like I need to do much. If I wanted to, I could take out some of the yellowness in in the practicals because um, their practicals are a little more kind of uh, neutral. So I could kind of select these things here and do a little bit of a wide qualifier and maybe blur that out a little bit and then you know do some like bring the highlights down. So the highlights, yeah, bring those down and take the sat some of the sat down a little bit. And now that's just a little closer to what the reference is, I think. Yeah. Right? Does this feel like it's maybe the same world? Eric, what do you think? I think it looks great. I think you did a good job. I mean, yeah, those are two completely separate. I mean, the lighting and doesn't, but I mean, yeah, it doesn't match, but you did a good job, I think, at matching them. So, you know, one thing that uh, we don't have too much of here that I, you know, in a busier scene I might be concerned about is you can, you can see in the Mindhunter reference that everything in the background is really monotone. There isn't a ton of color variation. You know, we got lucky in that there isn't a ton of color variation in the background in this, but you can imagine that in a real world shooting scenario, you would have like some greens and blues and oranges in the happening in the background bottles and paint or whatever that would really kill the the tone of this right and so for a lot of those things you would see me do what i did for that uh gas station sign you would see me go through and pick those colors out and bring those colors down as a way to shape the tone of the scene so really when we're looking at look development and look adaptation it's so much of it is, and particularly the color tone, is about the colors that aren't there. You know, high value, high production design, and really aesthetically pleasing things tend to be kind of monotonous. If we look at this in the in the uh, waveform, sorry, in the in the vector scope, uh, you know, it's all the colors are hitting in this one direction you know that for the most part when you shoot things in the real world you get a lot more diversity of tones and uh but you know when you're dealing with like these you know uh references that have these very polished very developed looks um that are done by you know uh kind of very uh a high-end production uh you end up with uh you know stuff that i lost my um where was my work? Oh, there it is. Uh, you end up with stuff that is 
you know, really tightly art directed at the pre-production phase so that everything fits in the world and nothing is distracting except for the actors, you know, that, that everything is shaped around what is the most important thing for the audience to see, what we want to shape their vision of. So, um, you know, you try and adapt those things when we're doing it in post, we're like fixing it in post and you're trying to, you know, everything is a time, there's a time consideration. You don't want to spend too much time on things. Uh, you can imagine here we've spent, you know, a, a little over an hour now uh, going through this. Um, but you can imagine that, uh, you know, when you're working through color grading, you know, time is money, you want to be as efficient as possible. You need to make decisions about these things that are kind of methodical and thoughtful, but they're not going to drive you into a corner. You're not going to paint yourself into a box. So, you know, one of the big picture things that um, I try and do when I approach grades is try to find the ways in which I can uh, make as much of the look as possible an overall thing. I uh, don't want to be painting the look into every shot that I do. I want the look to be something that I'm applying to the whole scene or best case, the whole film at once. And so it is things like shaping where the skins are going to fall, shaping, uh, you know, what tones are going to be prominent and what tones are going to be not prominent, what colors am I taking away from the scene, and then making decisions about those things, and then figuring out ways to make that work for the whole piece, so that the, sh the adjustments that I'm making on the individual shots are much more about the first things we talked about. They're much more about shot balancing, shot matching, and then, and then if I need to, and I find shots that, you know, aren't working uh, in terms of lighting or the audience isn't seeing the right thing or the shot itself is distracting, I can start looking at the techniques that we did in the second phase, which is, you know, shot shaping, figuring out kind of uh, uh, troubleshooting how to make the shot work um, uh, much more efficiently. Um, and okay, with that, uh, I think, um, I feel like that wraps up every, everything I wanted to cover. Um, we, we, have, we have a couple of questions. One yes. kind of related to what you just talked about. So uh, Bill asks, what if you don't have a reference still, how would you approach an image? That is a great question, Bill. Um, yeah, so more often than not, um, I don't necessarily have a, a reference still. I will have a conversation you know, uh, DPs, directors, they have um, uh, uh, thoughts on the matter. <laughs> Even if they don't have thoughts, there's a kind of language that we have, right? They'll tell me, you know what I like, or I want it to pop, or I want it to sing. So, you know, the, con the content will drive a lot of those decisions. If I'm doing a piece that is for a brand, the brand colors will be a prominent part of what the look is will be an important part of what the look is. If I'm working on a documentary um, and you know they want something that feels fluid and true to life, then I you know the look is less uh, stylized necessarily, but there's still probably a look. I'm doing a little bit of tweaking of the tone, the tonality, just making a decision about what the overall tone of the piece is. Is this something that's very you know? eye-catching? Is it meant to be something that's a little softer? Is it meant to be uh, dark and mysterious? Is it meant to be bright and energetic? Is it meant to be romantic? Is it meant to be analytical? Is it, these things can drive subtle decisions. You know, you might, for example, if you're working on something, uh, working on a documentary that was about technology, it was very high tech, we went a little cool with the, with the neutral tone. So the neutrals lent themselves to blue a little bit and a little bit more contrast and made it feel a little more edgy, a little more techy, a little more modern. Uh, you know, um, you might work on something that is uh, much more about uh, organic relationships. We did a documentary uh, recently about, um, you know, uh, it, it was about uh, people uh, working actually uh, across the uh, border from in Tijuana from uh, San Diego, right? Um, where, um, you know, it's people who, who have been uh, deported, but have been lived their whole lives in the States and they're working at call centers uh, that are calling the States. And so the film was about human relationships. And so a lot of it was about finding warmth and finding uh, emotional connection, emotional resonance. And so we, and it's also kind of set in sort of a, you know, 
warmer climate. And so we had overall warm, warmer tones and a little more kind of milkiness to the blacks. And, you know, our skins were a little bit more, um, you know, le leaned in a little bit more towards uh, these the sorts of notes that we were going for. Um, so the content will often drive that, you know, even if there's, there isn't an, a reference image, there's a conversation about it. And again, what I'm doing as I'm going through my process is, you know, first level, it's about shot matching and just the fluidity of the scenes. And so those are all very technical adjustments. And then the next level is about kind of shaping and making that work. And that can work regardless of the look. And then really the last level is that kind of overall look. And so those tend to be things that I can do all in one go and maybe even tweak a little bit, dial it in a little bit differently um, as we kind of revise, you know. Did um, Eric, did you, did someone uh, bring a sample for something that we wanted to kind of talk about? Oh, Eric, you're not, you're dead. Uh, your audio is dead. There we go. Helps if I hit the mute button. Yes, they did. But I, we got a couple more questions here. So maybe. Oh, we, yeah, shoot. Yeah. Questions and we can get to that. So. Um, so I'll just kind of work backwards here. So um, Bob asked, uh, how often do you try to learn a new technique? Um, and then Jackie wanted to know, were you going to go over color matching with different cameras? And then there's another question from Andy, but I'll let you get to those two first. Okay, so um, uh, to answer the first question first, uh, I yes, new techniques all the time. So. Um, you know, uh, one of the things uh, I, I hope, um, one of the things I've kind of um, passed along to you today is about, uh, give me one second here, just getting, my dog has decided that she needs my attention. Um, one of the things, one of the things that uh, I hope I've kind of passed along to you today is the idea that um, what, what these techniques that I've shown you, the various different like approaches that I've shown you are, it's, it's like, uh, it's like um, puzzle pieces. It's like Legos, you know, you can build your own outcome from them, but they're parts of the kind of techniques. They're not in necessarily in and of themselves techniques. And so uh, it, it's in the application of those things that you start to develop other stuff. So I will um, very frequently find myself uh, you know, uh, uh, with stuff that is difficult or frustrating or doesn't quite fit the mold that I expect it to. And then those are moments for real kind of innovation where we can figure out something new and then kind of adapt it. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've been talking, trying to talk you through here is stuff that I don't even think about anymore, really. Like I don't think through, you know, in a, in a clear cut way, you know, what, how do I match these two shots? I just kind of know, like, I just kind of, it just, it's just by feel now. It's like, I just, you know, before I can think it, I've figured out what it is. Um, but that's just because of practice. And it's just because of going through the creative process of like figuring it out, uh, it, you know, it, with, uh, with frustration and setback uh, and then growth from that. Um, and and another thing that uh, you know is happening actually, which ties into the second question, is the fact that the technology has evolved really quickly. You know, these things that used to be much more expensive and much less accessible have become much more accessible and much less expensive. And so we're being tasked with doing uh, more and more uh, uh, of it. And and luckily, the te technology is kind of aiding us. So one of the things that I found. Uh, has really helped us, you know, is actually in camera matching. You know, I have no shyness about, um, you know, if I'm matching, uh, like, I don't really have an example, unfortunately, but imagine I have, uh, as is frequently the case, I'll have like an A camera that's a Sony or an Airy, and then a B camera that might be a Blackmagic camera or a Canon camera, and they'll be recording their relevant logs. I will just pop on a, um, a color space transform node which is inside of Resolve. And this is quite handy, if I can find it. Yeah, color space transform. And this is just a, a, a node that just lets you apply uh, like technical transform. So you can say, okay, well, I'm inputting, my input is Aria Alexa and Aria Log C, and I wanna transform that to uh, Sony S Gamut Cine and S log three, and uh, you know, assuming that 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 was what was actually the case here, 
then this would transform that log format from one to the other and get me something that's going to be a lot closer in terms of the tonality uh, from one camera versus another. So that really helps get me, you know, 95% of the way. And then there are some differences between cameras and there's also just differences between setups and angles that I have to account for anyway, manually. And then at that point, I'm just going back to the same process that I was talking about before, you know, matching the luminance, figuring out the exposure and then matching tonality and, and balance. Um, one thing you will run into when cameras have different gamuts uh, and different color spaces is there are just colors that the cameras even, you know, uh, with these color space transforms that the cameras just won't hit, like one camera will hit and another camera won't hit. And so then in those cases, I'm having to go through and maybe like, maybe tweak a little bit. So I might, for example, take the saturation down or take the certain tones down in terms of density in the overall scene in order to comport it to what the weakest camera that was shot was able to do. Um, but that stuff is, I think it's rare that that's really a big issue. One one part where one time where that one circumstance where that does come up a lot is like, I've done a number of music videos and things like that where they shot things with neon lights. Um, they get very bright and saturated, and the way cameras behave with those is really different from one manufacturer to another, and so they can get really wonky. And so sometimes that can be a little frustrating and require a little more work. <clears throat> I've uh, just to chime in about the colors between cameras. So yeah. I shoot with Sony. Yeah, uh, a guy who's uh, Pat Espinosa, who's in in on this meeting as well. I he and I work together quite a bit. He shoots with Canon. And it's been interesting when we go out and we'll, we, a lot of times we'll be just shooting interviews with people. And there are, I found there are colors. Um, I, I want to say it's teal, but I'm not teal. sure. It's Is teal. It, <laughs> it's teal. teal. Can I tell you why it's teal? Because I had this exact, we had these, this conference with everyone had teal shirts on. And we had a Sony and we had, I think, a Sony, we had Sony and then uh, we had Black Magic. I can't remember what, but yeah, the teals were really hard. Yeah. If you change the teal, then the skin tone was, oh. It was just, uh, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> we, it, we, it, women will have this, these color, these teal shirts on, or, or it, it's usually, you know, or uh, men have a. I, I have teal shirts, Eric. So, I wear well, teal not, shirts all the time. I'm not making judgments. Why are you, why are you passing it? Well, it's a gender. Way, it's not gendered is, color. There's no judgments. Um, I mean, to represent the Charlotte Hornet fans. The teal is a fine <laughs> color, especially when with purple. So uh, to answer to answer we, that, when we look at it, yeah, it, it's amazing how you know. Yeah. And I'll, to, 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 to chip in for Sony, that Sony always seems to get it right, and Pat's probably going to come in here. <laughs> I'm Sony, not going to. I'm not going to claim uh, who gets right, who gets wrong. But yeah. I'll say that um, uh, there's a few there's differences. One in the sensors, right? So the sensors will have different spectral responses. Um, but I, but I think that's a less of an issue than the issue of, uh, one, if the manufacturer has like an in-house color, which is becoming less and less the case. I feel like manufacturers are becoming more uniform in, in their way of dealing with color, uh, particularly when you're dealing with like the raw records and the log records. But the other thing that happens is like the, um, the manufacturers will make decisions about how they store uh, the data that they get, how wh what the color gamut is of their recording format. So um, that gets really complicated. I don't want to I don't want to complicate this for you guys, but basically, you know, you have a, an, a, a certain number of bits inside of like a ten bit container or an eight bit container, and you have to make decisions about where do we delineate more colors, uh, like, and where do we delineate less colors. And the way you make that decision is you define a color gamut for your camera. That's the kind of color space, and and so that can lead to the circumstances where. In certain colors, one manufacturer with their log record will just have less variations on a color, will not be able to extend quite as far or reproduce a color quite as uh, uh, you know, definitively as another. And so you can get these situations where, you know, one one camera's teal looks a little seafoam and uh, another one looks a little more turquoise and it's, you know, it's just uh, part of the deal. So um, 
the color space transform, the one that I showed you, uh, I, I want to say that in a lot of cases, you'll see a, uh, a benefit if you have that ability, you know, it's inside of resolve, it's inside of base light, it's inside of like higher end stuff. I, unfortunately, it's not really inside of Premiere as far as I know. Um, but if, if you're working in resolve or you're popping stuff in resolve, and a lot of people do that, um, and you can use the color space transform to put everything into the color space that you want. What you would do in this case is, you know, assuming you want to work with, you know, your Sony footage and you've got a Canon shot, you would tell, you would bring in your clip and then you would tell this thing to say, okay, well, this is actually Canon cinema gamut and it's Canon log three, right? And then what it would do is it would, what this would be doing would be converting the math of the footage so that that Canon log three image gets transformed into a S log three image. And so then within the confines of what the camera is actually capturing or what the manufacturer allows the camera to record would translate that into the same place. So in the case of your Hornets jersey, um, you know, it should be in the right hue. It might not be as saturated. It might not match exactly right, but it should, it should be in the right direction, hopefully. I, I will say there is a plugin and I haven't fully tested it. I actually got a chance to beta test it and kind of dropped the ball on beta testing it because I was <laughs> I was busy. That's that's what it is. But it's called Cinematch and it's perp and it's and it's for Premiere um, and it's designed to sort of match uh, you know colors uh, between cameras. So oh great, so it does the, the same math thing. Yeah, it, it's relatively oh, awesome. new. It's relatively new. I ha like I said, I I actually yeah. have full betas, and I, so I haven't really played with it yet. But it's I'm surprised that Adobe good. hasn't adopted something like this. Uh, I know they've added some color management stuff, but it's just not very robust. But yeah. this is kind of the future of like because yeah. the the specs on what the color spaces are are all published, and we even have like big um, industry projects like Asus that have this data already about what the camera performance is and how the cameras behave. And so the the kind of the dark magic of like figuring out how to transform one camera's image into another camera's image, it's not it's not as obscure now. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like that's something I, I should look into that and so I can actually yeah. recommend it to people. But um, yeah, it's totally, it's totally something you could do with a plugin, should be able to do with a plugin. Yep. Uh, I Go ahead. Oh. I've noticed that uh, Final Cut Pro has it in their color thing, so you can change it. Yeah, um, they have their color management. I think I would. I want to say that their color. I don't really use Final Cut Pro, but I want to say that in the time that I have had to use it, their color management is pretty cool. Um, it's uh, yeah. I think the issue I run into with those there's always a it's always a problem of like making something as simple to use as possible versus like making something as powerful and robust as uh, possible. Yeah, definitely. And I think that FCP definitely is much more on the simple to use yeah, as opposed to robust. That's some of my beefs with it, but I didn't choose it for my work. So that's what I, you know, they said, this is what you're going to use. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andy uh, had a question of, are you seeing any new trends in color grading looks that stand out over years past? Um, yeah, so years past, I think we definitely saw, I mean, there was a period of time where I'm sure you guys saw like a low con look was very pervasive. I think now we have like HDRs becoming really popular. And so a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing in SDR is because it's derived from HDR. And so I think you're seeing kind of more contrast, more concern about how highlights are being handled. Um, I, I really like, I mean, I like a lot of the stuff I'm seeing Lately, I feel like things are getting, I mean, correct me if I'm, you know, maybe it's just me, but I feel like things look better than they ever have before. The standards are higher than they ever have been before. The expectations are sky high, uh, you know, in terms of uh, image quality and the expectation of image quality uh, at every level of the of production. Um, so I mean, I, 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 I would, I would be hard pressed to say that th things aren't, things aren't better than they've ever been. Um, I, you know, it, it, to, to directly address any of these questions, I don't know if I, um, I don't know if anything stands out to me, uh, lately, but, um, color correct all these zoom room camera meetings. <laughs> yes. The zoom thing is the problem, but even that, 
you know what like i mean we're doing uh, we've done a lot of commercials where people have like um shot stuff remotely with their iphones and the iphone footage is damn good it's i mean for what it is it's damn good <laughs> like i you know it's uh we're in a it's a it's a a, a you know we're cursed with riches uh, in terms of the the you know, quality of the image um I think, uh, I think, you know what I think, uh, Andy, to answer your question about looks, I think, I feel like the stuff that's driving things a lot more is like the Instagram, the, the social media stuff, the, the more independently produced stuff. I feel like they're trying more things and pushing the envelope and it doesn't always work. It's not always good, but I feel like that, uh, that's different than it has been in the past where before it was really the, the kind of the, the, you know, uh, gatekeepers that drove decisions about image and style. Uh, I feel like the gatekeepers have become pretty, like you look at f big budget feature films and they're pretty con like similar. Like there isn't a ton of, I feel like huge variation in terms of the looks of those. Um, but you look at like streaming services and tv series that are being done and there's a lot more polish there and a lot more cool stuff happening there i love you know there was that ratchet series on uh, netflix like the look of that was insane uh fleabag i thought looked great uh but it was such a good show i didn't even think about how good it looked um the queen's gambit looked phenomenal i mean streaming shows are really kicking ass and and then the stuff that I see on like YouTube, like I mean, it runs the gamut, but like I see some stuff on YouTube that's like really polished looking and like way, punching way above its uh, its weight class, which is cool. Dark, yeah, dark also looked really great. Um, Kevin has a question about uh, he says resolves color transform node is probably good for matching drone slash iPhone slash GoPro two, correct? Yeah. Um, you, the only caveat I would say is you because you those uh, particularly like GoPros and drone stuff, DJI, for example, they can record in various different color spaces. You need to know what color space it was recorded into so that you can match uh, correctly. And I don't know. I don't think that um, Resolve has like the, the there's like the GoPro log. What is it, what is it called? Like Go, Go, GoPro log? Is that what it's called? Uh, I know. Isn't it Cineform essentially? But do they call it something else? Or yeah, there's. I mean, it's not Cineform, but they. I think they dropped the Cineform stuff, but they call it something else. But I don't think that's on. That's in the Resolve um, database, unfortunately. So, like that, I don't. But there are some LUTs you can find that will allow you to transform it. Um, I usually with those things, if I have like a weirdo camera that I don't even. More often than not, when I have those things, it's like a shoot that has like six different cameras and. The vast majority of it is one camera. And then they've got some weird pickup shots that are random cameras. Um, I will just, you know, try and figure out, use my best analytical mind to try and figure out what the closest color space is for it. And then just hand tweak it the rest of the way, you know, get in the ballpark and then just, you know, chisel away at it until it fits. Uh, Rob has a question. How do you deal with grading to Rec 709 and then seeing your content slash film on different platforms or services looking different between each? Also, what monitor do you grade on? Uh, I have a, uh, it's, uh, it's off to the side here, but I have a, uh, we have Sony uh, BVMF 250As and I have a, an E250A over here. And then for client monitors, we have the LGO LEDs. So, I mean, we have like, pretty high-end uh, uh, reference monitors. Um, so we grade, we do great to uh, P3 uh, occasionally and, we have, and we'll have book time in the theater to kind of review. Um, the vast majority of our work is still Rec. 709 with occasionally we do um, HDR stuff. And, uh, and in terms of seeing it different on different platforms, it's infuriating, uh, it's getting better. Um, when we mastered Rec. 709, we properly flagged Rec. 709, or we mastered a Dolby Vision, and we properly flagged the Dolby Vision. When we're seeing it on other devices, I'm seeing more and more it looks correct. My reference for like the consumer device is my iPad. I look at it on my iPad with like the brightness set to about 55%. 
and the true tone turned off and the night night mode night mode or nighttime or whatever turned off and i look at it on that and it's it's darn close you know it's pretty close to the reference monitor to the point where i feel like it's better than it's ever been i gotta say um that said uh you know all you can do all the only thing we can do is grade to standard and and then once we grade the standard and assume that we deliver correctly to client it's gonna you know people can set their tvs up however they want and they kind of you know tvs out of the box are not great and they're kind of over contrasty and too like uh, off and everybody has this motion smoothing turned on and who knows what else and so uh, <laughs> make it stop uh it's a it's a it, it, i would lose sleep if i well i already lose sleep but i would not be able to sleep at all if i uh if i if i wasn't able to shut that off that, that's uh it's infuriating i have to say that that's something that i've when i send out projects before i'll send it to clients it's funny you, you mentioned your ipad i'll look at them on my i'll upload them to vimeo um, and I'll look at them on my, because I find that's the best out of the bunch, at least that's my opinion, but it, looking at it on my iPad looks really good on my Android phone, looks really good on the laptop that I'm doing this through, eh, you know, not as, yeah. you know, it's, but yeah, it's funny that the phone and the tablet look great. <laughs> the laptop is kind of, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll say that I tell clients I have a lot of clients who have MacBook Pros and the newer MacBook Pros are better, but the older MacBook Pros crush blacks a little bit. So you end up a little bit of black clipping. Um, there's uh, the it's there's an amazing amount of consistency and fidelity on the mobile screens. Uh, it's because they produce such a huge number of them. And, and because Apple set the tone for a lot of things. And, and I, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an Apple uh, diehard by any means. Uh, I, I'm sure as you know, Eric, um, but, uh, but one thing they've done really, really well is focus on the idea of kind of consistency and quality of their displays uh, on the mobile. And so uh, they have better color management on iOS than any other platform. Like the color management on iOS is actually pretty darn phenomenal um, and in terms of the software. And then they calibrate them at the factory and if you set them up right, they're really good. Like, they're like really, really good. Um, DJ has uh, one little question about uh, working ACES workflow with 3D programs. And if you have any information on that, he would love to get that from you or find out where he can find that if you have it. Uh, that I only applies to me. So that totally, we don't to totally don't need to go into a rabbit hole here. I don't have any um, particulars on um, working in 3D, but I know that, uh, I know that, I, I don't know, I have to Google it for you, but I know that there's a fair bit of documentation about using uh, Open Color IO, which is integrated in a lot of 3D applications. Do you use, what 3D apps are you using? Uh, I use Houdini, um, I use, uh, mostly Cinema 4D um, and mm -hmm. Octane. Uh, so you sometimes straight from Octane, sometimes straight from Cinema 4D. And then I know um, that, a little I know bit that, of Corona um, 3DS Max. Yeah, I don't know if Cinema 4D has uh, OCIO enabled. A lot of those a lot of those 3D apps do. Right. And so in those, there's a lot of documentation for using ACES instead of it. Some of them have ACES impl impl implementation directly, like Mm. Blender, I think, has ACES implementation directly, which is kind of awesome. Um, but if they don't, you can use Open Color IO to actually work ACES through Open Color IO. So there are ACES packages for that. And um, I mean, the cool thing about ACES for it, it's actually really awesome for 3D because you can render out like scene linear and this huge wide gamut, and then you know be able to like do your composites or whatever else you need to do because you, you know 3D inevitably requires a lot of post process even before you get to the point where you start color grading it, which you often do. And um, and so at all of those stages using a kind of straight ACES pipeline, this is kind of what it was made for, is yeah. like where you can composite and do, you know, tweaks and, and you know, post processes and then do final color grading and delivery. And it works really, really well. Um, I don't have specifics on those programs, unfortunately. I just don't use them that often enough to like have it offhand. Perfect, but, thank you. But I know that there are 
like there is a good bit of documentation about it. Any final questions for Juan? Get him in now because it is almost midnight his time and I do not want to keep him up anymore. So let's uh, get those last couple of questions in. If you have them, I'll give you 10 seconds to feverishly type out something. Uh, Jackie says, thank you. All caps, ex lots of exclamation points. <laughs> thank you, Jackie. Um, all right, I'll give about five more seconds here. Well, you uh, guys are typing. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. On the NVIDIA side with their color science and stuff that they're starting to put in with their broadcast and their streaming stuff, are you seeing that affect Premiere or Resolve or anything else where you want to turn that stuff on? Or is it only on the gaming side that that's really a problem? I think it's much more on the gaming side. Um, so one of the things we haven't really talked about just because it wasn't like in the subject of this thing is we're, we're kind of in the midst of like this HDR res revolution. And part of what's happening with like the HDR revolution is that it's making color management a lot more important because you you have a lot of, for example, desktop displays that are HDR capable that you're managing an SDR window onto an HDR screen. And uh, that's kind of what the NVIDIA stuff is touching on is like, how do you manage all of this? And they're trying to come up with a solution because to be frank, though, on the Microsoft side, they have really uh screw the pooch uh in terms of actually implementing anything mac os side it's like it is incredible you can have for example a win you can have a if you have an apple pro xdr display which is not a great reference display but it's a spectacular display um if you have a pro xdr display and you um bring up you're looking at your desktop and you bring up a window with an hdr encoded file on it the window will have these brighter values. So you'll think you're looking at like white in your web browser or whatever. And then you'll bring up a window with like an HDR thing. And all of a sudden it's like 10 times brighter, um, but just in the window. And it's this really, really cool effect uh, just because it's a really well color managed pipeline where they know these pixels in this window are meant to be these kinds of values. And these pixels in this window are meant, not meant to be those kinds of values. Um, and so, I mean, the promise of that, and that's something that's going to have to trickle down through mobile, and it's going to have to trickle down through uh, Windows, and and God help us, Linux. Um, the problem with the promise of that is that we will have a world where your OS will be very intelligent about what your display is capable of doing, and what the content that you're trying to display is meant to be seen as, and will be able to interpret what the content is meant to be seen as to fit what the display is capable of doing. So in this hypothetical world, everything would look the same, consistent from one device to another, to the constraints of the device. Uh, we're really, really far from that world being a reality, but that's the hope. That is the target. And But in the meantime, it's kind of a little bit of a wild, wild west. And so we end up with a whole mishmash of like different people trying to answer this problem differently and they're not doing it particularly well. And, and, um, and so uh, right now there isn't like a good, uh, solid, reliable answer that I can give you about okay. how that's gonna work. Um, I can tell you that for our purposes, we try to do as little as possible inside of the operating system and as much as possible on external displays because there we have really tight control over how we're handling the signal, how it's being managed. And so uh, that's what we do for a lot of those things. If you're used to, like most professionals, I think working in kind of a desktop environment and you're trying to use your iMac Pro, which has a really nice screen to be able to do like color critical evaluation, then that color management within the applications becomes a lot more important. Luckily, like Mac, like I said, Mac OS is pretty good about it. Um, Windows is not good about it yet. And, um, and there isn't a great solution yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, everybody, that was a phenomenal meeting. Um, oh, yep, thank you for doing this. I'm learning to edit and color grade and resolve right now. Have a nice evening, boy, yeah. I will tell you, Juan, I knew this was a good meeting and you could, the way I justify that is minimal drop-off. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> left the meeting. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Uh, no. to... um, 
but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. That was awesome. And uh, I think everybody got a lot out of it. I see a lot of people clapping hands. So yes, there's sure. I see jazz hands. It's great. Thank you guys. Um, it's been really fun. I, I, uh, we need to find the solution to the problem of not hearing the audience gasp and, uh, and clap. You know what I mean? Like that we need to translate that somehow. Hopefully we'll be meeting in person again someday. And then one you, of these days, yeah, I just that. have a soundboard that I press for when I do stuff. I just press the button and it. Gets <laughs> I didn't think to do that, but yeah, then you can just uh, you can have your own feedback. Oh, I don't use it for Zoom calls. I just use it when I'm sitting here at work. I'm just doing work. <laughs> Eric, you need a soundboard for each of your your guests. You know, just that's true. Clap track, uh, yeah, clapping. Yeah, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll have that next time on. I'll get like a whole like, <laughs> like sound library where I can just play sound effects at various points. So it's going to be like morning zoo radio. We can change the group name to like Eric and Dan in the evening. Sure. And it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ooh, awesome. It's like the sports games where they uh, pipe in live audience sounds in the background, even That's, though there's nothing but cardboard. Yeah, they have that cardboard cutouts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will tell you, as a sports fan, I turn that off. As a big soccer fan, I I can't stand the. the you just crowd. go on mute. No, what I do so for the games that I watch, you can on the and I haven't actually checked it this season, but it, you were able to go. The game would be on TV with the with the noise, with the crowd noise, or you could watch it on their streaming service, and you had the option of crowd noise or just natural sounds. Oh. And it was great. It was actually really interesting to watch the games with the natural sounds because you could hear the players talking Runs. to each other communicating <laughs> never get oh to that's it. awesome yeah yeah um and there was a few baseball games last year where they did that and it was really interesting to hear the players from the dugout i mean you always see them mouthing stuff on tv but you can never hear it and you could actually hear what they were saying and you could tell somebody was back there with the, like their finger on a delay button to you know try to get stuff but, <laughs> but no it was really interesting and i yeah it was kind of fun to watch it that way so well i'm really proud of myself i didn't curse uh that much uh that's my it's my habit to curse as much as possible well, thanks we, we shoot for a family audience here so well, yes <laughs> anyway i hate laugh tracks so that, i'm not sure I'm <laughs> <can't proud noise. laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Juan, man. I can't thank you enough. Like I said, at NAB, whenever we have NAB again and we're there, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of drinks that I'm going to be buying. And then and then fist fights. And then, oh, yes, we have some. Yeah, we have some beefs we need to work out over the hobby. <laughs> um, yeah, All right, guys, have a great night. Thank you so much for having me. And it's really been a pleasure. Thanks, Juan. Thank everybody, you. take thank care. You, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.